Good morning and welcome to um, the webinar here, Communities Charging Ahead, Resources for Electric Vehicle Readiness. Welcome to all of you. Hope you're somewhere warm watching this um, uh, webinar. Um, we wanted to start off with some context. My name is Diana McEwen. I'm with the Great Plains Institute and I direct the metro region of CERT. And we wanted to start with some context um, for you today. So as some context, um, wanted to um, first talk about the fact that Minnesota has an EV vision. And um, that EV vision uh, came out of a, a report that was actually published a year ago tomorrow um, called Accelerating Electric Vehicle Adoption, a Vision for Minnesota, which provides uh, a vision for, and strategies for encouraging greater adoption um, of the electric vehicle. So I'll talk more about that in a minute. But um, the agenda, we're just going to do some context here, then we'll review the resources that came out of cities charging ahead. Um, then we have a panel um, from Minnesota Utilities to talk about the resources they have um, in addition to the resources we've developed out of cities charging ahead. We'll talk about the state resources and then we'll have some time for question and answer at the end. If you have questions along the way, put them in the chat box so that we can um, queue those up as we get to the point um, and, and maybe even in between in transition we can answer some of those. Um, and just glad that you're here and hope that we can provide a bunch of resources for your communities to keep moving or charging ahead um, on electric vehicle adoption and acceleration. So as I mentioned, um, the vision came out about a year ago. It was the first um, kind of coordinated attempt to outline a statewide vision on electric vehicles. And they're really looking at 20% or 200,000 vehicles being um, electric by 2030 in Minnesota. And it's a great goal and it's a, an opportunity for us to coalesce around something that um, we could all um, kind of set our, our, our goals at. So we appreciate the, the state for putting forward this um, Minnesota Department of um, Transportation and the Pollution Control Agency and my organization, Great Plains Institute, also helps with that report. So um, e it just context, EVs um, in Minnesota nearly doubled from about 6,000 in the spring of 2018 to 10,000 in the spring of 2019. Here's a little map that GPI um, made with some data um, that we got um, from the Department of um, Motor Vehicles uh, through the Pollution Control Agency. Um, and just, uh, again, it's growing. It's not a trend, it's growing. And so um, just some context there for registrations and we'll hear more about that and where you can find more information about that. And then next, um, you know, really, you know, kind of sort of, you know, by the numbers, we're talking about the number of vehicles to 200,000 by 2030. Um, uh, you know, what we saw this past year, um, a number of cities putting in their comprehensive plans, electric vehicle um, work, whether it's in their zoning codes, city fleet, charging infrastructure, or general support, you know, the cities are really looking at this as an opportunity to lead um, and to help their community um, drive electric um, and, and get around in their communities. So um, about 34 cities, and that's just the Met Council town plans. Um, there are also greater Minnesota cities that have done that. And next, uh, again, in the like, realm of setting context, um, cities charging ahead. Um, oops, there we go. Cities charging ahead. Um, so folks have probably heard of this. There were 28 cities. We worked together for about 18, almost 18 months and um, you know, really worked at a couple of different things, the purchasing of fleet vehicles, charging stations that were available in public areas, and, and private, providing guidance uh, to the private sector on um, standards for uh, electric vehicle readiness. Um, and so we're really excited to, that work really led to a bunch of tools and resources that we're gonna talk about today, and those are all, um, you know, going to be on the Drive Electric site, and we'll talk about that in a second, but a couple of just notes is that what's next is that we're actually launching right now um, a work with a cohort of municipal utilities, about a dozen or so across the state are interested in working with us to help them um, and, and their members, um, and then we will likely have uh, some work with short action-oriented cohorts with cities that want to are really ready to take action this summer, starting this summer. So we'll you'll hear more about that. Um, and just a shout out for folks who haven't heard, and we'll send in the follow-up a number of the links and such. But there's an electric vehicle fire truck tour coming to uh, Minnesota March 4th, 5th, and 6th, and we'll send out the flyer in a couple of cities: St. Paul, Eden, uh, uh, Egan, Edina, and Rochester on those days. Um, so. 
Um, and then the last thing I think I'll say uh, before we go into um, you know, passing it off is um, talking more about um, the opportunity when you're looking at charging to have that come from renewable energy. And so um, you know, those are the cities, sorry, from char cities charging ahead in case you weren't aware of the cities that were involved in cities charging ahead. Um, we want to do the next slide. Um, so the uh, Pathways of Decarbonization Transportation in Minnesota and the um, vision that I talked about really, you know, talk about the benefit, that, you know, for um, the goals that we have in the state of Minnesota um, if we're linking that charging to renewable energy. And a number of cities that were participating in cities charging ahead are exploring that and looking at that um, and, you know, really prioritizing renewable energy for the, those charges. It's going to make a huge difference for cities in the state and the carbon goals, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, we're really looking at opportunities to support cities that want to also, that's the highest and best, you know, use there with um, charging is to make sure that it's connected to renewable energy. So all the resources that we talked about um, from City Charging Ahead that my colleague Caitlin will go through here in a few minutes are on the Drive Electric Minnesota site. Um, Drive Electric Minnesota is facilitated by Great Plains Institute. It's a partnership. Um, we meet about four times a year, and then there's some community meetings. Um, you know, there's updates. It's really the go-to source for um, electric vehicle information for the state of Minnesota. A lot of um, partners and partnerships around that. And we're always looking for additional members. Um, so super, um, you know, great if you all can join us, whether you're a local government, a county, a business, whatever you are, we're, um, we're happy to have you on board at Drive Electric Minnesota. So uh, these are the members currently, but join us. There's room, if you can see, there's room for more logos. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Caitlin Bachlin, um, who will do a deeper dive um, on the Drive Electric Minnesota site with the City Charging Ahead resources. Um, I work with the transportation and fuels team here at Great Plains Institute. And so as Diana said, I'm just going to walk you through some of the highlights of the resources that we developed uh, as part of the City's Charging Ahead project. And since I only have 20 minutes, I'll really only be able to scratch the surface with this. Um, but if you are curious and you want a deeper dive, please let us know. And uh, we'll be happy to walk you through these resources on a more deeper level. All right, so to find the resources, they're all housed under the Communities tab on driveelectricminnesota.org. So that's driveelectricmn.org slash communities. Um, and you can also navigate through the dropdown of the Communities tab, but I'll walk you through how to do it both, both ways. So if we scroll down to getting started, you'll see that there is really three paths from here where you can go. So you can explore tools under Becoming EV Ready, City Charging Ahead, and uh, our charging guidance tool. So we'll start with Becoming EV Ready. So if you click the Learn More, it'll take you to that page. And we're not going to go into too much detail here but I would encourage you to read through this page uh, when you do have some more time. It talks about what Becoming EV Ready is all about, the principles that go along with that, and then as you scroll down through the page, you'll find that there are tools and resources along each step of the way. And we are continuing to build this section out. Um, so if you have any resources in mind that you don't see, please let us know and we'd be happy to add them to this page. Uh, so the one resource I wanted to highlight here is the Summary of Best Practices for Electric Vehicle Ordinances. And this will be a guide that you can download. It's a PDF. Um, it was developed by colleagues Claire Cook and Brian Ross in June of 2019. But it's, 
It's really helpful if you're looking for more um, information on what other cities across the country are doing relating to electric vehicles and charging infrastructure and incentivizing these things through ordinances. Um, so you can click all of the links here. That'll take you to the specific ordinance page of that city. Otherwise, uh, this document will walk you through different groupings of um, ordinances. So that's all I wanted to highlight on that page. Uh, so we'll go back to our Becoming EV Ready page. And next we're going to go to the city's Charging Ahead resources. So again, you can get to this page either from that initial getting started page or through the drop down. And once you're on this page, it has a lot of great information, some background in terms of what City Charging Ahead was. It'll walk you through the goals, the accomplishments, um, there's some testimonials, what's happening next. And uh, what I wanted to highlight here is all of the case studies that were produced, and we are continuing to add case studies here, so do continue to check this page. Uh, there's a lot of case studies, anything from private development to community events, adding electric vehicles to the fleet, charging infrastructure. So there's a lot here that you can learn from. Um, and then additionally, we have all of our previously recorded webinars that you can find. So if you are ever wanting more information and you want to hear us again, <laughs> please navigate to this page and you can listen to all of the webinars here. And we'll also be adding the webinar from today to this page so you can find that as well. So next, we'll go through and highlight some of the resources that came out of City Charging Head specifically. And to get to those resources, you can either click here at the link, or if you scroll all the way to the top, there is a resources tab under the communities page. So again, once you click that, it will ask you to fill out a short form. Um, we do have a tracking cookie developed, so it should remember you at least for 30 days. Um, if you are experiencing that it's not remembering you, please let us know. We are continuing to evolve this. Um, but since I already had navigated that process earlier, we'll jump ahead to the resources. So I don't have time to walk through everything on this page, but I do just want to select and highlight a couple of them. So right here we have an electric vehicle content sharing kit for communities. That is going to be a document that you can download. And so I'll show you what that looks like. So hopefully you are all seeing this. We're experiencing a bit of a lag in the room here. Um, but anyway, it's a document. <laughs> it goes and uh, there's content on here that you can basically copy and paste right onto your website. Um, there's information you can add into your newsletters, sample press releases. So it has a lot of information. We encourage you to download it and please utilize it as best as you can. So the other resource that I wanted to highlight here <laughs> is uh, the Ride and Drive Toolkit. And again, that's something that you can download. So when you click the link, what you'll see is, let's see, I'm just going to share my screen and then I'll be able to see this. Uh, you'll be able to click through each component of the toolkit. There's like 13 to 14 different things that you can 
have access to once you download it. Um, and then when you do go into the actual checklist, it walks you through things to do before, during, and after the event. Um, so again, it's designed to be a checklist. There's a lot of information here. Uh, if you do have any questions about anything you see within the toolkit, please reach out to me. I help develop it. So I can also provide some guidance offline if you are planning an event. All right. Um, Let's see, so that was Cities Charging Ahead resources. The last tab that we have on the community's page is charging guidance. Um, in the interest of time, I'm probably not going to walk through an example, uh, but I'll just show you like what these different tools are capable of doing. So it's a three-step process. And it's really meant to help inform you and get you to the first step of the process in, before you would go and issue an RFP or start talking to electricians about your project. So this first piece of the tool, it, um, it will help identify what charging station is right for your use. So it's guided uh, through public, city employees and workplace, and fleet vehicle use cases. So then as you continue to click through, um, it will give you more information and it'll continue walking through some of the decisions along the way that you'll need to make. So if we, for example, let's say we wanted to install a level two public charging, um, It'll ask you questions along the way. Do we want to require payment? Let's say no. Um, track usage statistics. Sure, that sounds good. So it's suggesting a smart charger right now. And then it'll ask you, do you want to mount it on a wall? Yes or no. Let's say no. So then it's going to say, say you need a pedestal and a smart charger. Do you want to serve with more than one parking spot? Yes. So based on the answers, it's going to suggest you should be looking at a level two network pedestal dual charging station. And then when you click next, all of these links in green will take you to various places for more information. And then it'll give you the option to start over. So once you have that, <laughs> piece of the puzzle, then you can scroll down, go through the site selection guidelines. There is an interactive tool that you can use here. Um, you can also download the checklist if you don't want to wait for it to load. And normally, it loads a lot faster. So we'll skip that part for today. Uh, and then there's different checklists once you get to thinking about the actual installation. So you've selected where you want to install your station, and then these are gonna walk you through the different use cases. Again, we're installing a public charging station, so it'll have different tips, contact an electrician, where to start there, um, make sure you're installing proper lighting, um, testing the network, payment equipment, things like that. And there are also checklists developed for fleet charging and workplace charging. All right, so now we're gonna navigate a little bit off of City Charging Ahead and the community resources to, this is a blog post that we did on EV registrations in Minnesota. And just wanna show you a little bit how you can utilize this tool uh, to help inform where you might want to locate charging stations in your community and also understand data trends. So you can search for any place. Let's say we want to see what St. Cloud is up to. Or, yeah, let's, let's go St. Cloud. So then the map will zoom to St. Cloud. Uh, for this particular zip code, you can see that there are 15 electric vehicles registered 
in 2019. Um, as you scroll out, there might be other zip codes within St. Cloud that you want to look at, so you can continue clicking and identify that. If you click on the layer list, let's go back and set ourselves up for home. Uh, there's a lot of different layers that you can play around with on this map. So you can look at the existing and funded corridors in Minnesota, the proposed corridors, see where that lines up with EV registration. Uh, you can also turn off 2019 registration and look at 2018 registration if you wanted to do that. Um, we also have the ability to turn on DC fast chargers, uh, Tesla chargers, if you want to see the county outlines. So there's a lot that you can do here. And we encourage you to play around with this, use it for your abilities. Um, I think that's all I wanted to show you with that one. Oh, and then related to the map, you can also download PDFs for handouts. So the last resource that I wanted to highlight is related to fleet planning. And so as part of Cities Charging Ahead, we had several cities that engaged in fleet studies through Fleet Karma. And we prepared a blog post that uh, analyzed all of those fleet studies and pulled out some of the key lessons. So the lessons that we learned are more miles driven equals more savings. Um, look for vehicles that make a lot of short trips and switch vehicles that idle a lot. So if you look at your own fleet, taking into account these three lessons, you can usually identify what the right vehicles are in your fleet that you can electrify relatively easily, which ones make the best use cases for electrification. Uh, so our goal here was that maybe you don't want to go to the detail of having a fleet analysis done for your particular fleet, and you just want information, best practices to look for, lessons to look for. So that's what this blog post is all about. Um, and we are working to develop more resources to help electrify city fleets. So those will be coming probably within the current year, 2020. And I would also highlight that uh, Major Bean with MPCA, who we'll talk later, she can be a great resource and uh, she'll present a little bit more about what she brings to the table and what she can help you guys with when it comes to fleet electrification. So with that, I will turn it over to my turn. Okay. So I'm going to hand things over to my colleague Chris, and uh, he'll get you set up with the next presenter. So we have Tammy Gundersick, she's going to be here from Excel and she focuses on the Partners in Energy program and they recently um, have worked with a number of cities interested in transportation, electrification of transportation and they um, saw that need and, and worked out developing some electric vehicle tools for communities um, to support them and so we're really appreciative that you're here to share with us the resources that you have um, uh, developed, are, are developing, and how you're responding to and working with community. Thanks, Tammy. Great. Thank you, Diane. Um, excited to be here and just do a quick high-level overview of some of the different resources we have. Um, and I, I think kind of the take-home message is be sure to contact us if there's any questions you have and what you see here, and be sure just to incorporate your utility into your EV planning. That, that's kind of our mantra. Um, if not for the equipment and your planning, um, even so we can start to plan ahead for our infrastructure as we actually look at converting fleets and some of the charging requirements for this. What I'm going to talk about now is just kind of a moment in time at Excel, so be sure to check back with your account manager or on our website or on the Partners in Energy site. Um, to see what's changing. I'm going to talk a little bit about our EVs in Partners in Energy, as we referenced. 
um, and some of the planning going on. But we're excited about a new toolkit we've launched too. And then just touch a bit on some of the other Excel energy offerings going on appropriate for cities. Um, for EVs in Partners in Energy, a lot of what we've done historically has been just integrating in an EV plan as part of a, an overall energy action plan, as we call it, for Partners in Energy. Um, what we have now is a bit more robust uh, foundation to build on. We've got five focus areas integrated into our toolkit that we rely on even as we support this plan that we've got there, and implementation support um, coming through not only in the form of some of the different products coming into the market from Excel, but also what we can look at from the third party and what we're becoming more and more aware of. Um, things like we're talking about today with Great Plains and some of the state resources. So it's need to pull those together kind of into a more strategic approach. This year, we're launching our comprehensive EV plan. So where before we've done kind of an overall energy action plan, this really focuses on uh, communities' desire to put a robust EV strategy together, um, probably point in, you know, three or four of the focus areas that are, are listed over on that other side. It normally is a little less intense from the workshop side. It takes about two workshops. Um, Again, as we put that plan together, it's important to incorporate the Excel offerings back in that can support the different goals that the city wants. And what we see from the stakeholder team is where in our energy action plans, we normally go for about 10 or 15 local stakeholders. Here we're seeing much smaller teams and much more uh, city staff based. Um, the toolkit I talked about is available through the Partners in Energy portal. Um, there's the address. We've put this on the public side of the portal versus needing a log on for that, just so um, it should have a little higher accessibility to everyone. Um, we, we think with EVs it really is important. It's one of those things where it's, it's great if you're a community that works with Partners in Energy, but even if you're not, it, we really do need to kind of fill the lake and, and everyone will rise. Um, it's designed to be a resource whether you're new to EVs and just kind of poking around trying to figure out um, what it is you don't know yet, or if you've got a, a little more knowledge base or if you already even have a plan in place that you're trying to support. Um, as we put it together, you know, if, if you go in and find a resource that's helpful, that you, you can take it away and you don't need to interact with us, that's great. But really, um, I, what we found is I think more and more it, it, it starts to spur the questions and the thinking and maybe even that desire to put that plan together and realize how important um, a coordinated plan is versus kind of the single approaches. Um, to get to the plan, here's our website or our portal is xlenergycommunities.com and really you just need to click on that. Um, the page that will take you to is this. Uh, as you scroll down, you've got some different options. It shows you what our planning process is, asks some questions about kind of starting or gives some guidance, and then goes through the different focus areas. And within each of those focus areas, what we've got is just some basic information, kind of at starter level, some real initial um, first steps or quick wins that you might want to undertake with each of those, um, some different resources for that, some examples. And then if you really want to pursue um, that a little more robustly, some of the larger efforts or more in-depth studies to look at. Um, kind of integrated throughout that, again, is just the Excel programs and offerings. A couple things that Excel's got going on right now are we have got kind of the next generation of the Fleet Karma studies getting ready to launch um, under Fleet Analytics and Advisory Services. I've got a website down on the bottom there with Excel Energy Fleet EVs where there's a form, I believe a number of the cities have filled out, but, but it's available too, um, just to start to give some basic information. And I believe we've got a webinar coming up here in the next few weeks where we'll really go into more detail on that program and get ready to launch, talk about what the real requirements are and how it'll flow. So we're excited to get that back in the market and moving. Um, and then we, we've got the EV service pilot currently underway, 
and that is more for looking at charging infrastructure to support fleets. Our ability to provide um, that infrastructure up to the charging stub and kind of set up that new service if you're looking at you know a number of vehicles coming on. I think um, it's a minimum of four charging ports or about 50 kW in demand, but really um, gives a great opportunity for using our, that, that time of use rate to cut your costs around charging. Um, I think that's it until questions and answers. All right, thank you so much, Tammy. And as um, we switch over to David, um, just a quick question. Did So the resources you have, um, you don't have to have a, a PI login, so it's not only for PI communities, any community can use those resources? Any community can. And um, as you pull up David's slides and we unmute David, um, uh, the name one or two of the first steps or quick wins? Okay, the quick ones, I think it's even figuring out what your inventory is, um, what your budgets are, how does it align with your plans right now for what you're going to do with your fleet. Okay. Um, the education and outreach is another kind of quick and easy win for me that I think any community can do. Just starting to get your businesses and your residents thinking about EVs and, and introducing that technology. Right, and you've got some resources, and again, those the resources Caitlin just described, we have yeah. a bunch of education outreach um, uh, resources, so awesome. So now um, we have uh, David Nalo um, from Great River Energy to talk about some of the programs that they have that their co-op member or member co-ops um, put out there for um, acceleration, accelerating EVs in co-op land. David. Thank you. Good morning, Diana. Can you hear me? I can. Good morning. Uh, awesome. Okay. Well, hi. My name is David Ornalo, and I work at the Corporate and Member Services Division of Great River Energy. Um, we're a wholesale generation and transmission cooperative headquartered in Maple Grove, Minnesota. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, next slide, please. What you're seeing here is our members' um, service territory. So these blue um, highlighted cooperatives are our 28 member owners, meaning that they own us, being a cooperative. And then those member co-ops are owned by the homes, farms, businesses, and schools that they serve. Uh, our members serve mostly suburban and rural areas surrounding towns, but there are also some cities and towns within their territories. Next slide, please. Uh, several years ago, we launched a program called Revolt, and we were really excited about this, and we started the program because we heard that our members who had electric vehicles wanted a way to connect their vehicle to renewable energy. Um, so we launched this program that allows them to fuel their vehicle with 100% wind energy for the lifetime of their EV at no additional charge. We offer that to residential and commercial members. Um, it's created a lot of awareness just about electric vehicles and, of course, that renewable tie. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> you may have heard the saying, if you've been to one electric co-op, you've been to one electric co-op. Our members make up a very diverse group of distribution cooperatives, and like Pam, I'd like you to, to direct you to their specific websites for, you know, current special rebates and rates because they have some really great programs like time of use and off-peak rates to help charging EVs save money, and also direct their, their usage to when there's excess energy on the grid um, at times like overnight. Next slide, please. We're really excited to have recently launched an EVSE, or as it's called, an electric vehicle supply equipment promotion. We wanted to kind of give the Amazon Prime experience to our members and make it just really easy to get a charger installed in your garage, because we know it's a new step when you're making that transition from an internal combustion engine. So this offer involves Cooperative's regular charging station rebate, which is usually around four to $500, plus an additional limited time bonus so that they can upgrade to a smart charger and it also connects the member with a certified electrician that does these things. And, and it's not rocket science, of course. Uh, you know, I've heard if, if an electrician can't install an electric vehicle charging station, then they're not a very good electrician because it's a pretty simple uh, process. But this makes it easy to connect someone that the co-op has vetted and can show up at their house with the charger in a couple of days after they've ordered it. Next slide. Um, so the chargers we're offering through this promotion, we've partnered with Zeph Energy, a local Minnesota company who has a Clipper Creek charger 
And again, just to take the guesswork out, that's the only one we're offering today, but we have three different levels. They're all level two, but three different speeds or sizes, as you can see there by the KW um, for the promotion. Next slide, please. So I talked about it a little bit, but really we wanna make it easy. We think that one of the big barriers to um, electric vehicles today is just fear of the unknown. And <clears throat> so we wanted to make the purchase quick and, and painless reduce the upfront cost barrier by having that additional rebate. We also wanna use this promotion to collect more data on how people are charging in our service territory and then um, remove that burden of having to call a contractor. Next slide, please. Our members have various commercial and industrial, and I realize CNI is kind of a inside term, but commercial and industrial charging incentives as well, ranging from $500 to $2,500 per level two charger. Um, things like public or workplace fleet. You know, of course, pre-approval is required and rate participation may also be required that you're on one of those off-peak programs. Next slide, please. Um, but cars are not the only EVs we're interested in. We believe that electricity is a really smart choice and it makes a lot of sense when you start looking at things like productivity, cost savings, um, air quality and so on. So we recently launched a try it before you buy it electric forklift trial as well to encourage the adoption of these electric vehicles. Um, it offers a one month long rental for qualified commercial and industry members of our members. So it's up to about a $2,500 value. And we, we've we had a few of these and once they they try them, they make the switch. Um, you can, you know, with your account representative at the co-op quickly go through what the savings would be for your business. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to plug um, Yuka Kukinen, for those of you who know us, partnered with Great River Energy and some uh, and now a, a bunch of partners, I think Excel's on board and others, to bring you mncharging.org. And this is a website we developed mostly for car dealerships and salespeople to look at what utility rebates, rates, and incentives are out there. Um, there's people in place that keep it up to date. And you can virtually locate any Minnesota utility on that site and see or have a link directly to what sort of EV incentives they offer. So I thought that would be a good resource for this group. Thanks. And that's all I had, thank you. Well, was I going to get an introduction or should I just start? I'm sorry. Our our phone was on mute. I was introducing you. <laughs> um, so, um, Amy, um, so we have Amy Collins next with the Missouri River Energy Services. And what I was saying when I was on mute and you didn't hear me is that we're clipping along pretty well here. So we'll pause at the end of the utility panel and take some question and answers. Um, but Amy um, and Missouri River Energy Services has a fairly new program um, around EVs and I wanted her to be able to share that with the um, for communities that are in that territory. Right. Um well, thank you so much for letting me share um, our information on behalf of public power. So I think we've seen the gamut today of um, investor owned and co-op and now um, what the public power utilities are doing to enter this exciting field of um, EVs. And Missouri River Energy is based out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and we actually sell um, electricity to 61 member cities in the Dakotas. Iowa and Minnesota. And I see I have a chat, I'm just making sure. Oh, good. Um, and I work with 10 of these Minnesota member cities um, in Minnesota, and we are just launching our new program, and it is um, based on electric vehicle chargers, essentially. And really, it's a grassroots effort because being in greater Minnesota, many of our member cities are very rural and we are very light on the map for EV registrations, but we really want to change that and help be the drivers to get people feeling really comfortable with um, being able to own at least a plug-in hybrid version. Um, and then just 
support them on their journey. I'll go ahead and advance the slide. Um, our program, uh, similar to Great River Energies, is uh, based on charger rebates. We are different. We did decide to use um, the vendor charge points uh, for our incentives. Um, these incentives are good for both uh, residential and commercial customers that want to have their own personal electric vehicle. Um, they could get a $500 incentive. Now these charge point chargers are about $550. So it's $50 out of pocket for customers plus um, the electrician fee. And they can get that for as many vehicles as they want. So if they have you know, two owners with EVs, they can get two rebates. Um, if they do wanna choose any other um, charger, they are able to just get a $50 incentive for sharing some information with us so that we are able to understand you know, who, who has them in our service territory and uh, their usage patterns. And go ahead and advance the slide. The reason we chose ChargePoint um, is all these different reasons. It has an excellent customer portal. It's ENERGY STAR certified. And its retail value is low enough that customers can easily get, get one without a financial burden. Um, and it's, it's prepped really to take our customers into the future. Especially we don't currently have time of use rates, um, but in the future, if we want the opportunity to load control and provide a better rate to the customers, um, this gives us a good customer portal to help figure out how to best do that. Go ahead and advance. Um, in addition to offering the um, residential and commercial customers one for their personal vehicles, all of our member cities, so when I say member city, that would be each public power utility. Um, so for example, the city of Wadena is taking advantage of this incentive this year. Um, they'll be putting in the charge point level two charger and they're able every three years to get um, a $3,000 incentive for a lease of a charge point charger. And um, every utility can install one of these chargers. Um, and yeah, and we did launch it on January 1st, 2020, but even if um, they installed something in 2019, we were gonna go ahead and give them some incentives for that as well. Go ahead and advance. And the next, the next, of course, is the DC fast charger. So as we are very rural, we wanna make sure um, a lot of our member cities are along, we have some along the 94 corridor, we have a lot along the Highway 10 corridor, and we wanna make sure that they're able to provide that comfort um, to customers across the state traveling with DC fast chargers. We do have uh, the city of Moorhead launched their fast charger last year, and Alexandria, as well as Detroit Lakes, will be getting their DC fast chargers um, yet this year by summer. Um, we are providing up to 50% cost share with our public power utilities, up to $15,000, um, so that they're able to install one if, um, if it makes sense for them to do so at this time. And um, again, it'll help provide some additional data. I, I've seen some really great data points so far today um, with what you know, what everybody out there has already been doing, but hopefully we can have some good data off of this as well. And go ahead and advance. And then uh, what, what else we're doing is the education piece. Drive Electric Minnesota has a phenomenal site that I've been borrowing a lot from as we educate, but we also launched our own website. Bright Energy Solutions is the name of our incentive program. And it provides incentives for all sorts of energy efficiency measures. Um, electrification, um, we've been increasing incentives for electric food service. Uh, just like Great River Energy, we are offering a $2,000 incentive on forklifts, on electric forklifts. Um, and we're really just trying to help. This is a little bit more customer facing. So, you know, the members are the customers of Missouri River, but their customers um, need a resource too. So when they're going out looking for rebates, on their chargers, now they can also see, you know, cost comparisons from a non-EV model, um, where to find dealerships, et cetera. And go ahead and advance this one. Um, so I guess what I would ask, I noticed there are over 70 participants today, and um, I would love to share what we're doing, but also if anybody says, oh, I want to let Amy know what I think could help benefit her customers in this grassroots effort. Um, at, at the very end, I have my email and phone number, and I just invite any 
sort of ideas or what's worked or what hasn't worked as we move forward. We, we're going to host four ride and drive events this year, um, this spring for sure by summer, and maybe some more in the fall. And uh, most likely several of those ride and drive will be in the state of Minnesota. And we're going to try to censor to them around the customers that are currently already trying to expand their, their charger network. So Wadena um, and the Moorhead area, as well as Alexandria, Detroit Lakes. So they've already made that investment in the chargers and we're going to support them with helping them have a ride and drive event. So if anybody has extra ideas on that, let me know. And then because it is, um, we're so removed from the metropolitan sales force of EVs, it's really hard to find dealers that have EVs in stock. One example is I have 10 of our members and I only have two dealerships to visit, one in Glenwood and one in Fergus Falls. They're the only two in my territory, remotely in my territory, that have any electric vehicles in stock. Um, so we're trying to market this and let all of our customers know that we have incentives. And just if everybody listening would be our ambassadors to say, oh, hey, Missouri River's got a, a great program if you're in their territory. Go ahead and hit advance. So yeah, if you want to reach out and share ideas or you have extra questions for me on our member cities, here's my email address and my phone number. I'd love to hear from all of you and I just appreciate the great work um, with Drive Electric Minnesota, the invaluable resources and a huge thank you for letting me share our program today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. So um, let's take a couple of minutes um, before we jump into the state resources here and um, see if there are a couple of questions. Uh, I know that um, we did have one question about, um, you know, partnering with law enforcement to explore electric vehicles because there's lots of idling, et cetera, going on. And, and I'll say that during the city's charging ahead effort, many cities brought up um, that they really wanted to engage their um, public safety fleets and vehicles uh, because as some of them did some analysis of their fleets, they found that those were some of the vehicles that were best um, suited to be replaced, um, but there was challenges with the options out there for replacement right now for those vehicles. We know that there's some coming down the pike um, and that there's a, we believe a plug-in hybrid Ford Interceptor pursuit rated vehicle, and people are nodding, um, and Marcus or others that want to chime in, coming, Mm, 2021? Yeah, so we uh, at State Patrol now have five of the uh, escape hybrids, uh, 15 more on order, and then the PHEV comes 2021. And the escape hybrid, that's a pursuit rate? Pursuit rate. Uh, escape. So uh, of they've had the Explorer, right? The Escape, they okay. yeah. And then the plug-in EV, um, that's a Ford Interceptor. That's like more of a sedan model, right? No. Uh, it's a Ford I, Escape. Oh, it, that is too. Which is effectively a sedan now. Okay. But yeah, I mean they made a really tiny SUV. We could fight about that, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't got the same size as a full-size sedan, so our 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 perspective has changed. So um, great, those are good. Um, that, that's a good question, and um, we can, you know, there's yeah. definitely interest in there, and I think the options are coming, but not available. Is there another question? Yeah, uh, Patricia Scott asks, will there be any ride and drive events near Brainerd this year? Anybody? Um, well, Melissa I'm, Birch, are you I'm from Brainerd. <laughs> oh, that's right. Amy, talk to mm -hmm. us. Yeah, what I'll tell you is. That our member cities, the closest to Brainerd is the city of Staples, and that's 35 miles away, but there will definitely be an event in the city of Wadena this year, um, but it'll be likely more in the June time frame, and of course, that's about 50, a little over 50 miles. Awesome. I think we'll, um, we'll take more question and answers at the end unless there's another relevant question. Uh, yeah, Anders Thielen asks, any effort from utilities to implement uh, not time of use rates, but something like green of use rate, so charging when the grid is the greenest, not when energy demand is lowest. 
So it's not necessarily a perfect correlation, but asking about a green use stream. Good question. Yeah, um, I I know from Excel it, it actually correlates pretty well with our time of use rate. Just when we do have the excess renewables, there's when we have the the lower demand. Um, so we've got that. I think it's something we're looking at more in the future, especially as, as we roll out um, smart meters and being able to integrate that in with the fuel mix and and have that real time feedback. I think it's a number of years off. In all honesty, but definitely on our radar is something that's important. Okay. Okay, uh, this so is David from Jerry. I think our member co-ops feel the same way. Um, important and always looking for ways to make that that connection easier. So you, you know, as I talked about, you know, earlier when it comes to city um, um, looking, cities looking at charging, you know, we're encouraging them to look at renewable energy options, and I'm glad the utilities are thinking about from the distribution side and, you know, when they're plugging, you know, where they're, you know, locating their charges and how they're trying to really look at the greenest options. So charging, but with as much green energy as we can. Great. And the city, so, of, the city of Wadena, actually, their charger, their level two charger they're putting in will be 100% powered by renewable energy. Great. And there's a number of them around. I know that that, that was a something that the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency was really promoting a while back, um, using wind source and other utility programs to purchase the renewable energy credits to charge there, um, in addition to being now more being directly connected to solar. All right, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. Thank you all. Um, I, I like having a, a cross-section of utilities from an investor-owned, you know, co-op association and a, um, and the Municipal, because there's we have three different flavors of utilities here, so it was great to have um, that perspective. And again, I think the the takeaway is that um, people are all in, and the utilities are all in, and they're trying to figure out their customers are looking for this and wanting this, and they're trying to figure out how they can support you. So for cities and communities out there, remember to make sure to partner with and talk to your utilities about what you're planning and how they can be of assistance either through rebates or resources or planning or whatever it might be. Um, so thank you. Uh, so switching now to state resources because we also, there are also state resources. Um, we've asked uh, Mejabine um, Rahman to come here from the PCA to talk about, there's two different things that she's going to talk about. She actually is um, providing support to cities for fleet planning. Um, and then I've asked her, you know, we always ask her, what is the latest on the VW update, the settlement? I get, that's probably the most asked question that I get um, is when is the next round, when can we get money? what's happening, what are the opportunities. And so, um, Mejameen, thank you for being here and sharing with us um, resources from the state of Minnesota. Yeah. Thank you um, for having me. And as Diana mentioned, my name is Mejameen Rahman, and I am a mobile source specialist at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. So one of my responsibilities is to assist communities and businesses with electric vehicle adoption, fleet emissions reduction, and fleet greenhouse gas tracking. Today I'll talk a little bit about the fleet planning support and um, that I can provide as well as updates on phase two of the VW settlement. Next slide, please. So how can I help? Um, I can provide advice on engaging with stakeholders and what language to use, help in developing behavior change campaigns, help navigating the resources that are available. Um, I can help in, to assist in creating a fuel use and MPG reporting plan and structure. And I have information on more sustainable alternatives as well. I am currently working on an EV information page for small businesses. So if you have small businesses within your communities that would like to um, adopt EVs, I'm here to help them as well. And so with providing the guidance portion, um, Fleet Karma is a great program, but I know it's not the best solution for all um, communities out there. So I can help you do a little bit of that analysis with your fleet without the use of Fleet Karma, um, and then discuss about what options would be the best for you. And um, really, any help you might need or any questions you might have, please reach out to me so that we can discuss this as a part of my job, and I am happy to be here to help you. And, um, you know, one thing that I think all of us need to keep in mind is that there's a lot of emerging technology around medium and heavy duty trucks that are coming out onto the market that might be a good fit for your organization. As Diana mentioned, there's electric, 
fire trucks coming, um, and um, there's just also like step vans available, and it's just really, there's a lot going on right now. Um, and another shout out to Minnesota Green Corps. Uh, we are currently recruiting for host sites, and a member would be able to help you with a lot of the initiatives listed, especially with talking to people within your organization to get them on board with EVs um, and doing a lot of the behavior change aspects because while you know EVs are great and they really are a solution to um, a problem that we have, there, there are people who are kind of apprehensive about it and um, the education part is I think is, is essential to make sure that they are a successful part of your fleet. So moving on to um, the Volkswagen settlement plan for phase two. So as of Monday, the PCA has submitted the phase two plan to the trustees. It is not available on our website quite yet at any time now. It will pop up. So um, it is currently being worked on with the web team. And this pie chart illustrates how the MPCA plans on distributing the funds. 15%, which is the max allowable, is planned for use on Electrical, electric vehicle charging stations, 30% um, on heavy duty electric vehicles and 20% on electric school bus replacement. So that's a total of 65% of the funds on EV related projects. Next slide please. And so um, with the anticipated grants for VW phase two, let's see how those translate into numbers. So it is total of 23 and a half million funds anticipated to be available for grants from 2020 to 2023. 4.7 million of those are for the electric school bus replacement program, 7 million and 50,000 for heavy duty electric vehicle program, um, 3 million 525,000 for zero emissions vehicle infrastructure, and um, in additional uh, electric off-road vehicles are also eligible to apply under the clean heavy duty off-road equipment program which is a total of 2,350,000. So that would be shared with both electric off-road and um, diesel off-road vehicles. And um, just sort of a word out there that we are limited on what we can use these funds for. That is why our, the RFPs that you'll see coming out in the future have, have a lot of restrictions. That's because the VW settlement um, and the consent decree limits us to um, a lot of these things, especially I've had questions about why don't we use it um, for hydrogen infrastructure? We can't. Um, next slide, please. And so with the proposed electric vehicle charging corridor for funding in phase two, um, this is very similar to the map that uh, we saw earlier. It, we have um, these, so this is a way that all Minnesotans can travel throughout the state. The blue corridors already exist or were funded through phase one of the settlement. The green shows the proposed corridors for phase two. Um, and also there are currently no planned fast charging infrastructure in the metro area funded through the settlement. Again, this is a plan, this is what we're proposing um, and things do change, but um, this is our current plan for now. Next slide, please. One thing that wasn't in um, the phase two draft plan that people put, uh, commented on a lot was electric school buses. So this was the, one of the most common comments received. And as a result, the MPCA will create a pilot project to fund a limited number of electric school buses throughout Minnesota. The goal is to provide information on the electric vehicle technology for school buses and their practical uh, application. And um, so the analysis of data from that pilot project will help inform future electric school bus RFPs. If this is something that you would like to be involved in, um, I'm not in charge of this, but I can get your name to uh, the person who is. So please reach out to me and I will, um, try, I will get your name to uh, where it needs to be. Uh, next slide. So thank you so much, and I think we're holding questions till we're both done. Okay, perfect. Great. <clears throat> now I'm gonna turn it over to um, Marcus um, Grubbs. He is from the Office of Enterprise Sustainability, and um, he does a lot of work on the state fleet goals and the state contract. Um, is my go-to person when I get a question that I can't answer. I call Marcus, and he usually can answer it, but if not, 
um, helps me point in the right direction. So really grateful that Marcus could be here to talk to us about what's happening at the state. state. I know a lot of cities with cities charging ahead, we went through the process and as they then were thinking about buying the equipment, going to the state contract and understanding kind of what is on there and the process for uh, going about that, we're grateful to have um, you know, uh, somebody that really um, tries to help those cities get those, those vehicles and um, align with the vision of Minnesota. Yeah, great. Uh, wonderful to be here. Uh, I was not smart in adding my email address, but uh, you can Google me or Google the Office of Enterprise Sustainability. And we'll list some contact information and all the speakers on a follow-up. And we're happy to answer any questions you might have. So this is a picture. We took uh, one of our Chevy Bolts from St. Paul to Camp Ripley. And we couldn't charge at Camp Ripley. It was like 17 degrees that day into a headwind. We can't charge at Camp Ripley because those are federal electrons, and you can't put those in a state vehicle. But, uh, but you, but we made it. It was cold. We made it. And trivia. That was really good trivia. And we made it back. You can do it if you stop and charge at a Goodwill. So uh, <laughs> let's go here. Next slide. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some a little bit of background, and then. Um, you can see I borrowed slides hastily. But so as a state operations is what I focus on. So we have 24 cabinet level agencies that have a commissioner appointed by the governor and those agencies are subject to this kind of collective goal which is reducing our fossil fuel use by 30% by 2027. And so that doesn't mean we're electrifying necessarily, but however you want to get there, we say we use um, about 20 million gallons of fuel, 18 million of that is fossil fuels because of biodiesel blending and ethanol blending in our fuels. Um, we, as of calendar year 2018, we heard negative 5% progress towards our goal from our benchmark and that's because if you remember 18, which is a long time ago now, had um, heavy snowfall and so we uh, had a lot more plow miles on the road. Um, and um, we'll see 2019 data soon. So um, let's move on to the next one here. So the, our light fleet, so these are fossil fuel gallon, miles per fossil fuel gallon, not miles per gallon. Um, but our light fleet, and if you all are sort of familiar with the kind of like what was happening, in purchasing in, in fleets and things in the mid 2010s, uh, our miles per gallon actually went down, and that's because 2014, 15, 16, there was something called the Chevy Equinox that came out that got really poor gas mileage but was really inexpensive, and everyone wanted an SUV, and we had um, made some poor choices in allowing those vehicles to be purchased. Uh, but we have been rapidly, so these are model years, so each model year. So we have been rapidly trying to turn the corner here. As of 2017, we started to pick it back up. Uh, and now we're looking at 32 miles per fossil fuel gallon. And so uh, the next slide, please. That uh, reflects this, our large increase. We have about 6,000 vehicles in our light fleet. So that's uh, everything up to half ton pickup trucks. And so we have really been deploying a lot of hybrids and that cuts our fuel consumption significantly. And so in a way we're electrifying. We've got some electric technology going on. I mean, we want them, they're at the right price and they save us money. We've also been deploying PHEVs and EVs. And um, on the capital complex, we have 77 level two chargers, something around those lines. This was at the end of 2019. Um, you're looking at 87 PHEVs and 41 BEVs in the fleet. Uh, the number is probably 30 more uh, of each of those by now um, because of how our vehicles come in on ordering. So. Um, we're looking at, you know, over 100 PHEVs and, and probably 70 BEVs or so. The Outlander has been really popular lately. Um, and we've made some quick strides by just saying, we've, we've made some quick strides by saying everyone needs to try it and get them out there. Um, and in some places it's worked well and they've ordered a lot more. In some places it hasn't worked well. So, next slide. 
Uh, just for a little context, uh, the colors here are a little, if you'll advance, the slides will give you some um, animation here. There you go. So uh, the, oh, go back there. The total bar, the whole bar, these are our light, medium, heavy, and off-road vehicles. And the percentage shows how much of our fuel they consume. 16% uh, of our fuel goes into our light fleet. So we're not going to win the battle there in our light fleet. Uh, if we electrify our light fleet, um, we're not going to meet our 30% goal, right? So it's actually we'll win our we'll win our war in other um, in other fleet segments, but we see this as like a necessary place for us to actually to start. We need to start electrifying here, and then figure out the other fleet segments. And um, so you'll see on there, there's a bunch of strategies listed on the bottom in those bar charts that are stacked. But that last piece of blue, that's blue, right, everyone on the bottom? Mm -hmm. That last piece of blue is what we would expect for fossil fuel use in that segment to be left in 2027 if we were to meet our goal. Which means we got to get rid of all of our fuel use in the, in the light fleet to meet our goal. Um, and then a substantial amount in the rest of our fleets. We're actually really looking forward to four or five years probably having some commercially economic, commercially and economically viable medium duty vehicles. Uh, Metro Mobility is probably the easiest example of what those look like. Next one. Um, we have on, I don't know how much time I even have. Keep going. We have on contract uh, this year. So what we do uh, at the state is we have a central fleet and surplus services, it's called fleet services. And anyone, uh, and so they work on getting vehicles, they work with our Office of State Procurement, getting vehicles on contract, and then they also work with, they also work by putting out, they lease, they actually lease vehicles to agencies. Some agencies buy their own, but mostly we buy the vehicles and lease them to other agencies. But not only agencies, local units of government lease vehicles from us, um, or they may lease, lease vehicles through um, the fleet and surplus services, or they may buy vehicles off our contract. I want to show you some of the vehicles that are currently lease offerings, and then I'll say something about the contract. But So what we do is we give our agencies limited choices in purchasing, and we tell them to start at the top of the list and go down to the first vehicle that meets their requirements. So the first option they get is a Chevy Bolt. And we rate these all on um, their uh, GHG uh, emissions score that the EPA attributes to each vehicle. So they start with a Chevy Bolt. The Chevy Bolt doesn't work for them. They go to a Ford Fusion Energy uh, plug-in hybrid. That's a very popular fleet vehicle for us. We uh, have so many Ford Fusions, they, I think it's probably a, it's a relatively comfortable car. It's not great. I rented one once, I didn't enjoy it. But it's a relatively comfortable, it fits four people in some boxes, which is what most state people, state vehicles need. And um, the plug-in hybrid is it's still an, it's an affordable option. So that's what we do. And then we, you see we have this leasing price structure underneath it. So this when we lease it to an agency or another entity, we lease it to them on these terms, and that covers the maintenance, the repairs, uh, and the whole shebang. Um, it, it includes insurance for state agencies. It wouldn't include insurance if, uh, if, uh, if somebody else were to be leasing it, um, but the, then the cost would be slightly less. Um, it just so happens we insure ourselves, and then you'd have to get insurance somewhere else. Can through I your regular insurance. questions about that? Yeah. So um, it sounds like you know one concern I've had from cities, especially in Greater Minnesota, where they don't have yeah. a dealership or a place, and where do I take it if something goes wrong? Our mechanics don't know how to do this. This seems like a really good option um, to lease, because then you take care of that. And how, how does that work? So in those cases, so we <laughs> work with our customers to find a vehicle that works for them, and uh, because of that reason, if they are in Greater Minnesota, we will be very careful about what we in terms of like a Chevy Bolt, we're not sending a Chevy Bolt someplace where there's not a dealership within a reasonable distance to service them. Uh, so there's, so that's a barrier and it exists and it doesn't make sense for us to send a vehicle that could, that would need to be towed down to, on a flatbed to mm -hmm. Minneapolis or yeah. something, so, or Roseville Chev. 
if it's a bolt, for example. Um, so the Do you dealerships at all? We, we don't, but for the ones that we get on contract. So the dealerships are actually the ones that respond to our contract. Right. And I don't know exactly who's on the contract for the Chevy Bolts. It might be Rosedale Chevy. So I'm there's sure. one per uh, um, OEM or um, manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Chevy will have one dealership for a model. in Minnesota. For each model. For each model. We, we, may get, we may get all of ours from one dealer or we may get different models from different dealers. I understand one of the dealers is in Grand Rapids or somewhere in, in Greater Minnesota. Yeah, so per, it typically is a really, uh, the dealers that are on our contracts are typically in Greater Minnesota because this is a volume game for them because they make very little money per vehicle. Um, they need a lot of space. So that's why it works for them. They make less than, I mean, it's in the ballpark of around or less than $500 per vehicle. So we've squeezed out all of the profit on this. And due to the recent um, sort of uh, last couple years, there was some coverage from CARE 11 and some kind of contract issues that were brought to light that amounted to a a fairly small amount of money. Uh, there's a lot of new protections in here that really squeeze it even harder. So we're really, we've got the money down to very little. So you can lease from us. So if you go to the next slide, there's some more options here. And so then we just give them go down the line. And then we have Toyota Hybrid, um, Toyota Camp Corolla Hybrid, which is like an amazing, ridiculously amazing vehicle at something like 52 miles to the gallon or something like that, 53. Uh, Toyota Prius hybrid, and then next one, uh, Toyota Camry hybrid, Ford Fusion, regular Ford Fusion, next one. Then we get into the Pacifica, and then we've got, and that's not the plug-in, and then we go to the Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV, which is also a very popular option for us. We're going to be getting another um, hybrid van on contract, which will be the Toyota Sienna. And then the next slide, um, you know, we just keep going on the list. So we've got the Ford Escape Hybrid, which is a really great option that is out. And next year we expect we're expecting to have the plug-in hybrid on contract to compete with that Outlander. Uh, and then the Rav4 is also going to be having a plug-in hybrid Rav4 next year is what we're expecting from them also. Next. And by next year, you mean model year 2021? Model year 2021, yeah, which you'll be able to start ordering at in like December of 2020. Um, and then the, the Toyota Highlander and the Transit Connect, and these are all of our relatively good options. And you can see as you go down the list, the emission score goes down because we're really, we are focused on the emissions and the fossil fuel reduction. And so we really are trying to find those wins. So you can also go to the Office of State Procurement, if you are not a CPV member, which is called a Cooperative Purchasing Venture member, or know what that is, you can contact us. Um, there are some 3,000 members on that list, so your entity may around the country purchase off our contract. So your entity may actually be on that and you don't know already, um, but what that but you can just get on it. It's like a, uh, you take a pamphlet and you send it in with your name and your phone number and your agency, your organization is on it, nonprofits or public entities. And that means then you can buy vehicles off our contract. The other wait, wait, wait. nonprofits, the GP, I can go on and buy, not that we're doing that, but we could. Off our contract. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, and so um, that being said, you can also just take our contract price to a dealer and they'll probably honor it without it being a CPV member. Um, and so those contract prices, I didn't show you that because it's like a really complex spreadsheet, how they break down the prices. Um, but you can purchase off our contract. We've got the Bolt, the Leaf, the, a whole bunch of options on there. Uh, or maybe we don't have the Leaf this year. I don't think we have the Leaf this year. That's important to know. I, don't, I didn't see one. I'm going to double check. It may not have been done on the contract by the time this leasing rate book was put together. So I'll double check the list. And these are the 2020 models, right? Yeah. And Nissan Leaf is a very 
I'm pretty, I'm fairly certain it may it just didn't make it on contract by the time this book was done. It doesn't mean it's not it's on contract now. It's sometimes it's really difficult to get these. Policies. And when you don't have them, it's yeah. because the dealership they don't is not. They're not, they don't interested. they're not interested. Um, maybe they don't have enough availability to consider yeah. about how many vehicles you'll re people will request through your process. And Toyota for, is very particular. They don't actually have a fleet program per se. Um, Toyota dealers are offered a certain number of vehicles to sell every month. They can't order a big lump, um, and so those are more. Those are really difficult to get. Nissan, we have had. We've got many, many leaves in the fleet, and so. Uh, I'm certain it's not contract. We just it probably wasn't done the time this rate book was done, and um, so you you can use that. I mean, in, it's the contracts available, and you won't find a better price. The other option would be going through some group like Sourcewell, formerly NJPA. Um, they have a financing mechanism that they've partnered with a firm to develop so that uh, to bring the price down. Our prices are still better. Our prices are still better on EVs. Even when they were able to take advantage of the tax credits, we still squeezed them out on price. And so, um, and you might have different. They might have different vehicles. They work with a national fleet. Um, right. Too. We very particularly when we order our EVs, we get like particular option seated seats, for example, to make sure that we're maximizing the battery. So that we've done some of that homework for everyone. Make it easy. We're trying to. Marcus, are you the easy button? We're trying to. And one other question. It's still not easy. It's very bureaucratic. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so that's my next question. Thank you for that segue. Yeah. Is that I've actually had some cities that were part of cities charging ahead. They've gone through this. They've seen us do this, and then they they're great. We've got the state contract now. What? And I don't I don't know because I don't know how to navigate that. Do they yeah. call you, or is there somebody else that they call? So there's an office of state procurement that would be able to provide them with assistance. Um, but if they contact me, I'll send them to the Office of State Procurement. There's a contact for cooperative purchasing venture members, um, and they can assist. Well, so we'll get that information for you and put it out there because as much as it's nice to talk to you, perhaps they can yeah. just go right directly to the person. And you should. Ultimately, there's all kinds of great products to purchase. We've done a lot of work on contracts around sustainability in general, cleaning supplies, equipment, appliances, all kinds of stuff. Furniture, and so that's all really helpful stuff. So, sorry, I keep interrupting. Yeah, no. Next one. Um, we are updating our um, EVSE electric vehicle service equipment contract. Uh, it should be done here in a month or so. What we're really trying to do is catch up to what the market has to offer, uh, technology-wise. So we want level two network chargers that have the ability to do load balancing, um, operate up to four chargers on a single circuit in certain applications. Uh, we also want to be able to provide home-based charging to our um, people that are employees that park their vehicle and office out of home so they can charge probably a PHEV and pick up 20 miles electric or something like that. We have a lot of inspectors for the Department of Agriculture or people that work for the Department of Corrections that do a lot of driving out state in our office out state. We have to figure out what that like metering and networking and bill rate all looks like so we can charge them back. There's not like a federal reimbursement rate for electricity like there is for miles. So we have to figure that out. And then we want um, uh, the contract would also include the validation of the install so that's not a separate fee like it may be, might, you know, can appear to be a separate fee from some vendors, we want five year networking fees, should say fee up front. We want to know what we want a five year warranty up front. We want some indicative pricing on major replacement parts like cords and communications components. So we've seen we've got all and then we also want web based access to the data with the download that comes as a CSV and the ability to do load management. So we're not this is all available in the market. We just want to make it easier to buy so that you're comparing apples to apples instead of one vendor that's got a pricing structure with four separate items listed and one vendor that's got a pricing structure with one price listed. We just want one price from every single vendor for the different potential configurations that are out there. So look for that and I'll send an email and then it, um, GPI can send it out after that. Next slide. I don't know if I have another one. You know, that's it. Awesome. That was fantastic.
Um, so I'm going to open it up for questions because I, uh, and if anybody has any more questions for Marcus, because I really, as he was talking about it, I just wanted to catch those questions as, as they were coming up for me and, and ones that I know that have been happening. Chris, do you want to read questions? <clears throat> yep. Um, so our forklift, Joel Hastert asks, are forklifts considered heavy duty vehicles for the VW settlement funds? And if so, could this be then coupled with a utility rebate? Um, I do know that forklifts are included in some of the grants, so just keep your eyes open for what is um, is what is going to pop up. We're we'll, we'll, we are hoping to publish a rough timeline of grants um, in the near future. It just isn't ready yet. But yeah, forklifts are something that we we would consider. I, I'm not saying we know right now whether we will be able to fund something like that, but it is something that we consider. Would forklifts count? Would forklifts be on the DARA, the Diesel Emissions Reduction Act grants for off-road vehicles? Would forklifts be included in that? Um, it would probably be included in that. It might be included in other um, grants as well, depending on what the RFP says. Do you have a sense, uh, since you're, you're going to publish a timeline, because that's what you've already gotten, when, 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 when. Um, so you'll publish a timeline soon. Do you expect that any grant period will open up before the summer? Since we're currently in that process, um, again, I can't yeah. say or not say anything, but keep your eyes open. <laughs> uh, please do that. All right. Um, and obviously, the heavy duty things are, are good on the fleet side, but on, on the charging side, I think that's where a number of communities have been asking me about when are those charging. And you're going to have criteria on that. I know in the past, you know, looking at high pollution, air pollution areas, because it's really to help mitigate air pollution. I mean, yeah. we're trying to remember the, 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 you know, where this money came from. It's from the diesel emissions, so it's about air quality. So if you're in a community where you have air quality issues, you're probably more likely um, to fit a criteria. Definitely, and that's actually included in the phase two plan, so I can talk about it a little bit. Woohoo! Something she can talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, um, similar to our previous um, rounds, for, especially for level two chargers, there will be consideration for environmental justice areas and uh, vulnerable populations. Awesome. Chris? A uh, couple questions that are a little bit related. How can we draw more awareness of EVs and push more dealership companies to promote the growth and advancement of EVs more specifically in the northeast, northwest northwest regions of Minnesota. And uh, feedback from a local auto dealership is that a barrier to offering EV sales on their lot is service requirements. Ford apparently requires a dealership to purchase tools and technology for EVs that cost the dealership a lot of money before they can even sell the EVs. Dealerships are not confident they will recoup the investment. No one will buy an EV in northern Minnesota. Most people want pickups. As a quote. So, uh, you know, the, the, so the NPCA started the clean car rulemaking, uh, and that is going to require, you know, dealerships or OEMs to potentially, if whatever happens in the rulemaking, potentially to require a certain percentage of vehicles to be low emission vehicles or zero emission vehicles. And that will require them to invest money in their dealer networks. I, you know, it would be like, the geographic distribution of that investment is like anyone's guess, but uh, with we have a huge, we as a state um, have a a big interest operationally in electric uh, bigger vehicles and sedans, particularly in that medium um, vehicles, which we consider to be a class two, so a two fifty, maybe to a class. Uh, eight, um, so that 250, 350, 450, 550 type of vehicle, uh, we are, have an eager interest in electrifying those, and and with two OEMs bringing out electric pickups in 2021, I have to have a feeling that, or three, if you consider Tesla, you know those those uh, medium duty electrics are are coming. It is one thing that we're conscious of is that there's there's some give and take here where you know it's a different type of service model and somebody loses in that potentially. 
right? And I'm just looking at a, a, a two days ago, and I'll include this link. Two days ago, Motor Trend put out electric rodeo. We run up the up, upcoming EV pickup trucks, and, and um, there's some interesting looking pickup trucks that are um, promised to, to come out over the next couple of years. years. I don't know what that thing is, but um, so. Um, that's really the point. I, I think it's a game changer in Minnesota, especially greater Minnesota, if we have a, a pickup truck, especially the most sold um, pickup truck, the F-150 is like, I don't know, 35 or so percent of the market. So good stuff. Other questions? Is there a list of ride and drive events around the state that we could possibly attend to use the info for our own events? Um, yeah, so for ride and drive events, Drive Electric Minnesota does have an event page, and we do publish events that we know about on there. Um, I'll also say that American Lung Association in Minnesota runs Midwest Evolve, and they also do a lot of events. So you can find events on the Midwest Evolve page. Um, and if you are holding an event, please let us know, so then we can provide outreach for that event as well. And use our Ride and Drive toolkit if you need to. Other questions? That's all that we've gotten so far, so if you have any other questions, feel free to either raise your hand or type them in the chat or the Q&A section. Well, and again, you know, if you are a community, whether you're a city or um, a school, or we're not doing as much work with schools, but certainly our tools can be utilized with schools, and it looks like school buses are, are an opportunity, um, or a utility, um, a municipal utility especially, um, let us know. We've got some opportunities coming up but with um, municipal utilities right now. We're kicking off to work together to find out how we can share information because we're not all creating from scratch. The education materials, the programs, you can learn from each other what worked, what didn't work. It's a really valuable process. Um, and then cities, you know, including cities that were part of cities charging ahead, but others that are starting to, you know, we're seeing a lot of growth coming and a lot of action coming. We are going to have focused cohorts of cities that want to do action oriented, um, you know, like two or three month long. Let's get in here and you know buy that vehicle, you know analyze our fleet and buy that vehicle or get that charging installed. We're really going to be trying to be focused on the learning, but also really the action. Um, uh, so um, somebody asked um, on the call um, on the chat. Um, they were hoping Minnesota Power would be involved in the call, and they're not. Uh, I couldn't have every utility in the state on the calls because I don't want to. I, I don't think you guys want to be here all day long. And so we tried to choose, you know, some representatives. Minnesota Power is doing um, work on electric vehicles. Um, I, they have a rebate. They've done some work. I think two harbors about six months ago put in a um, a charger that uh, Minnesota Power um, work did. Um, so they're very involved. And um, Paul from their staff and others have been engaged in um, projects that Drive Electric Minnesota and Great Plains has done. I don't know. I'm going to keep looking at Caitlin if she has more to say about that. But Minnesota Power is involved in doing things. And so if you live in that area and you didn't hear from them because they weren't on today, call them and ask them what they're doing or look at their website and talk to them about, again, planning, what you're thinking about, how they can help you, what resources they have. Um, you know, all of the IOU utilities, investor-owned utilities, were required to file plans with the Public Utilities Commission about electric vehicles. I mean, this is this is happening, and so um, you know, they're they they have staff that are engaged and involved in it. Anything else that that covered it? Um, I see it's 11:30. Unless there are any other questions or comments from the the speakers. Um, Really um, want to thank you all for being here. This is really helpful. We'll send out a follow-up email um, with uh, links and such, with resources um, and you know blogs and things. Um, probably more than you want, um, but um, hopefully um, what you need. And um, you know follow up again with me, Diana, um, and others, and we'll try to get you where you need to go. We want to help you. you. The point of today was there's resources and help out there, whether it's nonprofits and you know um, entities like and certs the statewide partnership or the utilities the state etc there are resources out there for to, to support you you don't have to do this alone um, so thanks everyone um, stay warm out there <laughs>